Here we are, good morning. This is the physics video lecture, physics 2A, video lecture 37. And I had a couple of requests for homework and quiz problems. So let's just work a couple of problems. Actually, I have one problem here. So we'll do a homework review problem. And that is chapter nine, problem 43. Nine, 43. That's a Bernoulli's principle type of problem. So here's what we have. We've got a water tank and it's on some pedestal here. So the height of the water tank is H. I'm going to do this all with letters. So we have H here and D here. Oh, maybe not D. Uh, we'll call this distance here D. Yeah. So this thing springs a leak and therefore water shoots out. And I'm going to have it land a distance D okay, from the base there. So for this pedestal, we need some height. We'll call it capital H. There we go. Now they gave us a piece of information that we don't really need. They said the diameter of the hole here is just a few millimeters. The reason for that is that we're going to take the water coming out being, or the hole being small enough so that this water line doesn't really drop rapidly. And there are two parts to this problem now. What are they asking us for? We want to find H in the tank. Okay, so find H given capital H and D. Okay, so we'll just do this purely symbolic. symbolically. This, of course, is just a projectile motion problem. So I'm going to call that part one for the projectile. And for that projectile, we have x equals v zero t and y equals capital H minus one half g t squared. So when y is equal to 0, h is equal to 1 half g t squared. So when y is equal to 0, which is down here. So this is just projectile review, right? h is half g t squared equals 1 half g. And then this t here is going to be d divided by v0. to square it. Okay. So D equals V zero T, I can call it T star, that's when it hits there. Okay. So there we go, this is what H is, and we'll just isolate this, and we can use it for whatever we need. G, D squared over two V zero squared. So there's a relation. Now, what's the unknown here? We don't know what V0 is, and we're going to get V0 in terms of this H, okay? So this is just a projectile problem that relates all these quantities, and what I've just shown is this part of the problem here, okay? So that's that. Now, the fluids aspect of this is the Bernoulli's equation part, but I'm going to make short work of that because that was part of our lecture notes. What we found was that for water leaving a tank, that the speed with which the water leaves here, V0, is just given by the usual free fall expression for something that goes through this distance here under gravity. So we actually know that our V0 
is equal to root 2gh. Okay. So let me go ahead and number these here. We have 1, and then we have our second equation. And the unknown, the unknown is the h here. So if we substitute 2gh for the b0, okay, 2gh would be the b0 squared here, then we can just solve for h. Okay. So substitute. B0 squared equals 2gh into equation 1 and then solve for h and solve for h and what will happen there is your value for capital H was given your value for D was given and the only thing left there is you're going to see things cancel out pretty nicely. Okay. Because 2, you're going to have a G canceling against that one. Good. I'm going to leave it right there. Okay, so those are, this was a projectile problem here. And this was the result of the Bernoulli's equation calculation. So we'll put that as a note as well. You guys put that in there. This was because of Bernoulli's equation, and that is in the lecture note. So that was a result we could just use. Okay, and, and like I said at the beginning, the three millimeter hole or whatever, that was just to indicate to us that the hole was small enough. All right, we'll leave that there. So that was problem 43. The other two questions were regarding quizzes 11 and quiz 12. Let's go ahead and have a look at those. Quiz 11 was the orbiting satellite. And uh, a couple people were confused by my giving a multiple of Earth's radius. So let me just draw a picture of what was going on there. So we have a circular orbit. So this is quiz 11. We have a circular orbit of a satellite orbiting Earth. And the radius of Earth, 6.38 times 10 to the 6 meters. Okay. And what I said was, it's going to be orbiting some number times that radius of Earth. So the machine then gave a random number between, who knows, two and three or two and four or something like that. One and a half and four. So we had given R equals, you know, some number times the radius of Earth. You know, the example was R equals, say, 1, or I'll just use 2.5, 2.5 radius of Earth, okay, R sub E. Then you had to multiply radius of Earth by 2.5. And, and on my picture right here, if I did use 2.5, we would be out, so that's 1, 2, 3. Remember Newton's law of gravity uses the distance from the orbiting particle to the center of the spherically symmetric central body. So good, what did we have here using Newton's law? We had <coughs> F equals MA, but of course centripetal. So um, G M M over R squared is equal to M B squared over R. And what we were solving for was the speed. 
solving for b. Okay. So we can simplify this. Mass, one power of r, and here I'll use red to complete the thought. So now we solve for b. That's the square root of g mass of earth divided by this radius. Okay. But this radius was maybe 2.5, or this is just an example, times the radius of earth. So you plug that in there and put your numbers in, and then you actually get a result with the speed of the satellite. Now one thing that's useful in problems like this if you're doing a lot of them, is to consider the near Earth orbit where we know the acceleration is lowercase g, right? The free fall acceleration. So we can use Newton's law um, to write, this is something for future reference really useful. You have g m over r squared, right, that's this thing here, canceling that m is equal to g. So this is a shorthand way to get these, you know, these more or less difficult numbers, like g times m. So g times m, you could say, is 9.8 meters per second times the radius of earth squared. That's a good one to keep in your, uh, in your bag of tricks. But yeah, there, otherwise you just had to look these numbers up, carefully plug them in, and uh, get your answer that way. So that was quiz 11. And by the way, if you've never done this before, go ahead and look these three numbers up. Gravitational constant, mass of Earth, radius of Earth squared, and actually calculate them. Look them up in your book and calculate them, and you'll see you really do get those 9.8 meters per second squared. per second squared. Okay, so that was quiz 11, and then we also want to talk about quiz 12. And that was the most recent one. That was that little static problem. So we had Quiz 12, we had a beam, there's our beam, uniform beam, and it is supported at one end on some kind of a pedestal here, and over here, there is a rope, the rope's going to have a tension, T, and we have a total length L of our beam. The rope is supported a distance D from the end of the beam. And we know the mass of the beam. Okay. Let, me, let me get rid of this L right here, too close to the middle. So there's L. Okay. And we have a mass of the beam. And right now, I always like to put a little star there at the center of mass. So we have mg. And depending on how you want to solve this force, this problem, we can also say there's a normal force there. So well, this is a statics problem. It turns out we can just solve for the tension by using the, this as the uh, axis of rotation. So, net torque is going to be equal to zero. Okay, we're going to measure the torque right here, like a red dot. Measure the torque right around here. And what do we have? We have a counterclockwise torque, which would be mg L over 2. Mg is the force, L over 2 is the lever arm. Okay. And then we have a clockwise torque, we'll give that the minus sign, 
that is tension, which is what we're looking for, times this distance, which is the total L minus D. So P times L minus D. And there we go. We'll solve that tension there. That, by the way, that equals zero. We solve for the tension. It's MGL over 2L minus D. And we were given M, we were given L, and we were given D. And again, the program generates some random values between such and such a, I give some range, it generates some random values. So you plug in your mass, your length, and that length D, and then you've got the tension there. Okay, perfect and elementary torque problem. And okay, so maybe maybe for next time you might want to think about what is this normal force? So I'm going to put here question. Normal force equal to, because I didn't ask for the normal force, so I could ask for that next time. Okay, which would be interesting as well. Okay. And you may, then maybe you'd have to solve the net torque and the net force equation. Be that as it may, that's a perfect little statics problem. Doesn't even involve any angles. Uh, good. Okay, so that is our review. Let's see how we're doing time-wise. Fantastic. We've got nothing but time. Okay, we're back into thermal physics, and we're starting a new chapter. Chapter 11. What is this chapter even called? Energy in thermal processes. So chapter 11, I'm just going to write energy. We're going to start it off, how about we just call it thermal energy. Start it off with a demonstration. So wish me luck on this. It's always one take. Okay, I brought to class some butter and it's a stick of butter. Butter. And it has on the label some nutrition facts, including calories per serving and so forth and so on. So go ahead and have some butter, check out the nutrition label. If you've never done that before, what we're gonna talk about is the calorie. But uh, talk is cheap. What I wanna do is demonstrate thermal energy in terms of butter. So what I brought along here, this stick of butter, I've actually used it before, but it's still good. I'm going to make a candle, a candle using this butter. It's like a cooking show right now. And what you need to do this, and you're going to want to do this and take a picture and include it in your homework. That'll be fun. Um, what you do is you need a cotton string. It has to be a real cotton string, not nylon, because so, cotton uh, doesn't burn uncontrollably and you just push that cotton string right into the butter. Okay, and you can, so you push it in, you close it up, it's a butter candle, and I'm going to Okay, I need to make sure there's a little butter on this. There we go, okay. So this is a, you know, that's a candle wick, and I just have to slice off the end of the wick. Got some scissors here. And let's see if this works. Make sure there's a little butter on the wick. Okay, good. Like 
Like I said, wish me luck on this. I'm gonna prove a point. What does that do for you guys? Okay. So we'll set this thing up. I'll use this board here. So there's a candle. Okay. And I've got matches. Make sure we get a good picture of this. You guys could get a screenshot of this too. Get a screenshot and show it to me in your notes. Okay. That's a candle, a butter candle. Let's see if this. Oh, fantastic. Beautiful. Okay, the uh, sound that you may have heard there comes from the fact that butter has a little water content, right? It's not pure fat. But now I want to show you what is a calorie. Now, this is just a mock up, but I'm going to use this as my picture. So imagine we have a beaker with water in it. And we have a thermometer. Okay. This is just a picture, this is an image for you guys to put in your notes. The idea is the heat from the butter candle would heat up water in this picture here and we would register the increase in temperature, say in degrees Celsius, that came about from burning the butter and uh, heating the water in there. So that picture is something I want you guys to have in your notes, an image of that. And we'll declare victory, right? That's a successful butter candle. If you guys make one of these at home, just make sure you use a pure cotton thread. It's gotta be pure cotton, otherwise the nylon will just burn up. And uh, it's no waste of food either. When I'm done with this thing, I'll pull the string out and, and scrape off any, uh, any soot and it's butter as good as it was. Good, so declaring victory on that. Take this all apart, put it away, and we can start discussing what it is that we just saw. Okay, one step at a time. Okay, once more, proof of concept. Here is your butter candle. Okay, good, back to theoretical physics. What did we just see? What did we just see? So let's just write down for starters, we have a demonstration of a butter candle. And the picture I was just talking about, we have a beaker here on a stand um, okay, it's got color, right? It's got some water inside. Now, I didn't show you any water, but you're supposed to use your imagination. And we have a thermometer. Okay, we're on the roll with the color today, okay. Degrees Celsius. Got water. 
And now the star here is that we have this butter candle, which from now on you'll always think of a candle as being a square object, but the butter candle, and there is some flame. Okay, we got the butter candle. Now the idea is that we burn the fuel and it raises the temperature of the water and we register the raise in the temperature of water. So what is a calorie? Calorie is whatever will produce a one degree Celsius increase in temperature for one kilogram of water. So I'm just gonna write calorie raises the temperature of one kilogram of water by one degree Celsius. And it's important that I'm spelling this thing with a capital C. So continuing here, one calorie spelled with a capital C equals 1,000 calories spelled with a lowercase c. We're going to go ahead and stick with the uppercase c because that happens to be the food calorie. So the calories on my label there that I was just talking about are food calories, capital C, And this is also referred to as a kilocalorie. Okay, one kilocalorie in honor of the factor of 1,000. Okay. So there is a measure of thermal energy. Now, remember we talked about heat and sensation of hot and cold and so forth. We did talk about energy because we said, well, the ideal gas is just a bunch of kinetic energy, okay, of moving molecules. But actually now we're back to this empirical standpoint and we don't really know yet why this is energy. Because what is our unit of energy? Our unit of energy is the joule, okay? We're not there yet, but it's just an empirical measure of things getting hot and you can burn fuel to raise the temperature of something. Okay. That's the standpoint we are right now. So there's something called the heat of combustion that I'm going to mention next. And that's how many calories that you can get, how many calories you can obtain from different substances. Okay. And Instead of memorizing a whole big table, we'll just go with the ones we've already heard before. So heat of combustion, fat, we're told that it has nine calories per gram, okay? And then, so this is in the food realm. Um, and so these aren't that exact, you notice I don't have any decimal points here, but that's fine. Nine calories per gram, and then protein, we're told, as four calories per gram, carbohydrate, also four. And last time I looked, alcohol, which burns, has seven calories per gram. So those are heats of combustion and you can just look up a whole list of things. But it's good to stick with the food aspect for a moment because you may wonder how many calories does a certain amount of food have? And you may wonder, well, how do they find that out? This demonstration is how it's actually done, except in a more controlled manner. So whatever is being, um, whatever has its, is having its caloric content determined has to be dried, remove any water, and then burnt. And you have to, not, you don't want to lose any of the heat, to keep it concentrated and you have to use it to raise the temperature of some amount of water and then you can do a calculation figure out how many calories there are 
So for example, potato chips, they're just soaked in oil. If you ever pour some into a fire, it's just a grease fire, okay? They have a lot of calories, it's all oil. It's mostly oil. Lettuce is mostly water, and if you wanted to determine the content of the lettuce, you'd have to dry it up, maybe turn it into a powder, at which point there would be very little left and you would burn that, okay? So it's literally heat of combustion. Okay? You have literally burn it um, to, de to make that determination. Good. So that is heat of combustion and this is the calorie. Now we want to turn this subject into energy and that is the subject of the next section. Let me see the time here. Okay, perfect. Um, well, let me give an example before I move on. So that stick of butter, and I'm not even gonna use calories per gram or anything, but if you go off the label, one quarter pound of butter has 800 calories, 800 calories, and that's a stick of butter. So that full stick of butter I had there had 800 calories. So for example, you could raise the temperature, see one calorie, raise the temperature of a kilogram of water by a degree Celsius. So suppose you had 10 kilograms of water then you could say times 80 degrees Celsius. So that would, that would uh, be 800 calories. So 10 liters of water, if you wanna raise it from room temperature to boiling, okay? From 20 degrees to 100 degrees. Okay. That would require that much butter. So there's an example. Um, this is an example for us. If we were just calculating that, we're not actually going to do those calculations because there's a you know, there's another step in the process. But we can just right here. So this is just an example. So again, if you look at your stick of butter, quarter pound, that's a stick of butter. It'll say 800 calories and uh, 10 kilograms of water, 80 degrees Celsius. That's 800. Right? One kilogram of water, one degree Celsius. That's calories. Okay, so that is thermal energy, but we haven't yet made the connection to the joule, and that's what we're gonna do now. So let's erase all of this. Actually, I'll, I'll leave this definition up here. That's not bad. Nice little picture. So the next topic is called the mechanical equivalent of heat. This term calorie comes from quasi-ancient times, which is say a couple centuries ago, when the idea was that heat is a fluid that flows from one object to another. Okay. And uh, it's a concept with some contradictions and it's not really true. But that's where the name comes from, it was called caloric. So the calorie comes from that. But now we're at the mechanical equivalent of heat, so we're about to talk about mechanics again. Of heat. Okay. And here's something you may want to look up and get an image of, a joule churn, because it's not easy to draw. But the idea is that uh, first of all, if you rub your hands together, they definitely get warm. That's because friction results in heat. Force through friction results in heat. And the Joule churn did that with water. So my primitive picture is just of, you can have a crank on the outside of a tank of water with a propeller, so you crank this propeller and you agitate the water. 
I think Jewel actually had a real churning apparatus in here. But for our cartoon, then you have a thermometer there. That's how we indicate a thermometer. Give you a little color. Okay. You've got a thermometer, degrees Celsius. You do some work on the crank here, and the temperature of the water inside here increases. So if you want a better Joule churn, maybe there's one in your book. But you can see that's the calorie idea, because I'm just going to do some work and raise the temperature of the water. Well, if you do this really carefully, you discover the mechanical equivalent, in other words, how much work you did to get so and so many calories, and this is what you find out. One calorie equals 4,186 joules. And that's the capital C kilocalorie food calorie. And there are other experiments that do the same thing. It's interesting, though. Um, so it's a conversion. And this equality, and, and as far as we measure it with the joule churn, it's that we do the work and we indicate how, you know, we find out how much the water temperature increased. Okay. So I, I put a little arrow here. We'll talk about that later. But yeah, that's the mechanical equivalent of heat. One calorie. 4,186 joules. So I'm going to put that into context with a good example of work for that many joules. And my example is the stair climb. I probably did this earlier in the semester. Just when we were talking about work, and now it's going to come back to haunt us. So let's draw a stair climb here. We're about to climb the stairs and uh, end up at the top here, okay. H. So we know that the work is just MGH, we've done that 100 times. Let's put some numbers in again. Suppose we have 80 kilograms, 10 meters per second squared for G, close enough, right? And five meters. Okay, so what that gives us is 400 times 10 is 4,000, which is pretty close to my 4,100. So 4,000 joules. So just the act of climbing a five meter flight of stairs, that's one food calorie worth of work. Now. We're not just perfectly efficient machines, so our body is certainly going to use more than a single food calorie. And so there's some factor there. You could look it up. Um, probably depends on the conditions, actually. Nonetheless, this is exact. Okay, This is exact mechanical work. And if you do that mechanical work on you know, a certain amount of water, you'll get the corresponding increase in temperature of the water. It corresponds to the definition of the calorie. Okay, so you do so and so much work, you change the uh, the temperature of the water. Good. So that's the mechanical equivalent of heat. So once we have that, we can introduce a concept that allows us to just just talk about joules anymore and. and abandon the calorie okay but I don't want to I never want to abandon it fully because it's you know it's part of our day-to-day -day life and you need to know this connection okay but uh, we will just beyond this always just talk about the joules the energy and so we can have different kinds of energy right we had kinetic energy and potential energy and now we have thermal energy and it also is measured in joules Good. So, let's see how much time we have. I'm going to do one more. Fantastic. So, I'm going to end with a concept called the specific heat capacity, and it's going to build right off of that.
So my general cartoon for talking about heat transfers, which is also part of this chapter, is that we imagine some quantum of thermal energy, I call it Q, it's entering some object here, mass M of mass M uh, and temperature T. Maybe I'll draw it a little bigger. So I can put the M and the T in here, okay? So heat is entering this thing, it has a mass M, a temperature T. And what we say is, and what we, first of all, we experience, the temperature increases, okay? The thing gets warmer, just as we were talking about with all of this. So what we have is this quantum of thermal energy is going to increase this temperature of this mass. There's a constant here labeled C, which I'll explain in a moment, and delta T. So the thermal energy increases the temperature of this mass by this delta T. And this is a material constant called the specific heat capacity. Okay. I'll just draw a little arrow down there. And every material has its own. And let's first of all talk about the units. Specific heat capacity has the units. Remember, just solve for C. It's Q over M delta T. So its units are joules per kilogram degrees Celsius. And there's one heat capacity that you can guess because of this relation right here. So we'll start a table of heat capacities. Leave some room in your notes. You know, you can copy a few more of these out of the book. But we'll just call this specific heats. And we'll take water, C sub W, well, what's it going to be? One degree Celsius, one kilogram, 4186. Okay, so that one we could guess based on this definition here, definition of the calorie and the mechanical equivalent of heat. So 4186 joules, kilogram degree Celsius. Happens to also be pretty much the highest heat capacity in nature. Interestingly, this is liquid water. Specific heat capacity of ice is half as much, 2,090. And uh, specific heat capacity of copper is somewhere around 900. You guys look it up and, and plug it into your notes. And if you look up the heat capacity for lead, it's going to surprise you by how low it is. Okay. So the higher the heat capacity, the more heat something can soak up with a small change in temperature. And the lower it is, the greater the change in temperature for a given amount of heat. So yeah, go ahead and look up in the book and add a couple more of these to your notes. And uh, there's a heat capacity lab. You may have already done it by the time you get this lecture here, but sometimes that's the way it goes. Okay, I'm still going to talk about calorimetry uh, thoroughly enough. So this, this chapter has a lot of great stuff, and uh, let's add a homework problem to the mix. Let's see what we would have here. <clears throat> so I haven't quite topped the calorimetry, so I'm going to leave that off for a moment. Yeah, this is good. So homework 37. So we're in chapter 11, and just a couple of really basic problems. Six is good to get started. Seven is really interesting. I'm going to say a word about that before I shut this down. And nine. These are good problems. Let me give a little description of each one. Number six is just a simple application of this definition. Okay, you'll figure it out. Number seven talks about 
a waterfall. Okay, so what's a waterfall have to do? I'm going to raise this. The idea is if water falls off of a waterfall, okay, here, let's draw us a waterfall. So there's a cliff, there's water coming off of it, okay, and you roiled up at the bottom. Then its potential energy has changed to kinetic energy. And if it flows away, then that potential energy that was converted to kinetic energy on the way down and then just flows away at the same speed it had up here. All of that energy given by this height difference can be can be thought of as having been turned into heat. Okay. So what you're looking at is MGH equals MC delta T. Oh well, I just gave it away. Sorry about that. Still think about it though. Okay. That's conversion of energy to heat, of mechanical energy to heat. Number nine, it's going to involve some big numbers, a whole lake full of water. Energy to read. Ah, yes. So for number nine, so this is number seven. For number nine, you have to remember that power is equal to energy divided by time, okay? Work divided by time, watts, joules per second, right? So you can solve this for time, because they're gonna ask you a question about how long, how many, you know, how many years, how many seconds. Time is going to be equal to energy divided by power. I'm gonna call the energy work, okay? Divided by power. And if you're using joules and everything else, consistent units, this time will come out in seconds. Okay, you may have to do a conversion. Okay, good. Enough for today. It's a great chapter. You guys make your butter candle and then see you next time.